The Trojan Girl by N.K. Jemison. In the Amorph, there were wolves. That was the name Moreau used because it was how he thought of himself. Amid the scraggling tree structures and fetid heaps, he could run swift and silent, alert to every shift of the input plane. He and his pack hunted sometimes, camouflaging themselves among junk objects in order to stalk the lesser creatures that hid there, though this was hardly a challenge. Few of these creatures had the sophistication to do more than flail pathetically when Moreau caught them, tore them apart, and swallowed their few useful features into himself. He enjoyed the brief victories anyhow. The warehouse loading door shut with a groan of rusty chains and badly maintained motors. Moreau set down the carton that he'd been carrying with a relieved sigh, hearing Neverwin do the same beside him. Zerostrian and other members of the pack came forward to assist. What'd you get? She asked. Her current body was broad-shouldered and muscular, sluggish, but strong. Moreau let her carry the biggest carton. The usual, he said. Canned fatty protein, green vegetables, enough to last us a few months. Breakfast, uh, breakfast cereal for carbs. It's pretty cheap. <coughs> Any antibiotics? <coughs> Asked Diggs, coughing after the words. The cough was wet and ragged. She carried the smallest box and looked tired after she set it down. No. They wanted something called a prescription, added Neverwin. He shrugged. If we'd known ahead of time, we could have fabbed or fished one. Too many people around for a clean pirate. Oh, thanks a bunch. Do you know how long it took to get this damn thing configured how I like it? Moreau shrugged. We'll find you a new one. Quit whining. Diggs muttered some imprecation, but kept it under her breath. So Moreau let it slide. That was when he noticed the odd tension in the warehouse. Zoe was as serene as ever, but Moreau knew her. She was excited about something. The others wore expressions of, what? Moreau had never been good at reading faces. He, might, he thought it might be in anticipation. What's happened? He asked. Diggs, the newbie, opened her mouth. Faster, the veteran, elbowed her. Zoe eyed them both for a long, warning moment before finally answering. We found something you should see. In the Amorph, there was danger. In endless, primordial variety. Far and beyond the threat of their fellow wolves, Moreau and his pack had to contend with parasitic worms, beasts that tunneled to devour them from below, spike bursts, and worse. For the Amorph was itself a threat, transforming constantly as information poured into it and mingled and sparked, changing and being changed. Worse were the singularities, which appeared whenever some incident drew the attention of the clogs and news burps and intimate nets. These would focus all their formidable attention on a single point, and every nearby element of the amorph would be dragged toward that point as well. The result was a whirlpool of concatenation so powerful that to be drawn in was to be strung apart and recompiled and then scattered among a million servers and a billion access points and a quadrillion devices and brains. Not even the strongest wolves could survive this. So Moreau and his pack learned the signs. They kept lookouts. Whenever they scented certain kinds of information on the wind, controversies, scandals, crises, they fled. In his youth, Moreau had lived in terror of such events, which seemed to strike with no pattern or reason. Then he had grown older and understood. The Amorph was not the whole world. It was his world, the one that he had been born into and adapted to, but another world existed alongside it, the static. He learned quickly to hate this other world. The beings within it were soft and bizarrely limited and useless individually. Collectively, they were gods, the creators of the singularities and the amorph, and tangentially, 
Moreau and his kind. And so, underneath Moreau's contempt lurked fear. Underneath that lurked reverence. He never looked very deeply inside himself, however, so the contempt remained foremost in his heart. Faster was more than the veteran. He was also the pack's aggregator. They all entered the Amorph, where he had built a local emulation of a warehouse, a convenience as this kept them from having to unpack too quickly after upload. There, Faster showed his masterpiece, their quarry, cobbled together from resource measurements and environmental feedback. It even included an image, of, an image capture of her current avatar. She appeared as a child of seven, maybe eight years old, black-haired, huge-eyed, dressed in a plain t-shirt and jeans. Faster had rendered her in mid-flight, arms and legs lifted in the opening movements of running. He'd always had a taste for melodrama. I'm guessing she's brand new, Faster said. Faster, Zoe, and Never stood as Moreau circled the girl. Never's eyes had a half-glazed look. Part of him was keeping watch outside the emulation. Her structure is incredibly simple. A basic engine, a few feature objects, and some maintenance script. Moreau glanced at him. Then why should we be interested? Look deeper. Moreau frowned, but obliged by switching to code view. Then, and only then, did he understand. The girl was perfect. Her framing the engine at her core, the intricate web of connections holding her objects together, built-in redundancies. Moreau had never seen such efficiency. The girl's structure was simple because she didn't need any of the shortcuts and workarounds that most of their kind required to function. There was no bloat to her, no junk code slowing her down, no patchy sores that left her vulnerable to infection. Ooh, she's a beauty, isn't she? Faster said. Moreau returned to interface view. He glanced at Zoe and saw the same suspicion look lurking in her beatific expression. I've never seen anything like this, Moreau said, watching Zoe speaking to Faster. We don't grow that way. I know. Faster was pacing, gesticulating, caught up in his own excitement. He didn't notice Moreau's look. She must have evolved from something professionally coded, maybe even government standard. I don't think we could be born from that. They couldn't. Moreau stared at the girl, not liking what he was seeing. The avatar was just too well designed, too detailed. Her features and coloring matched that of some variety of Latina, probably Central or South American given the noticeable indigenous traits. Most of their kind created Caucasian avatars to start, a human minority who for some reason comprised the majority of images available for sampling in the Amor. And most avatars had bland, nondescript faces. This girl had clear features, right down to her distinctively formed lips and chin and hands. It had taken five versionings for Moreau to get his own hands just right. Did you check her out for feature objects? Faster asked, oblivious to Moreau's unease. Why? Zoe answered. Two of them are standard add-ons, an aggressive defender and a diagnostic tool. The other two we can't identify. It looks like something new. Her lips curbed in a smile. She knew how he would react. And she was right, Moreau realized. His heart beat faster. His hands felt clammy. Both irrelevant reactions here in the Amor, but he was in human emulation for the moment. 
It was more of a pain to shut off the autonomics than it was to just deal with them. He looked at Zoe. We're going. We'll have to hurry, she said. Others are already on the trail. But we know where she is, said Faster. Diggs is double checking the feeds, but we're pretty sure she's somewhere here in uh, Fishville. Moreau inhaled, tasting the simulated air of emulation, imagining it held the scent of prey. That's our territory, which means she belongs to us, said Zoe, and her smile was anything but serene. Moreau grinned back. It had been natural for the two of them to share leadership when their little family came together, rather than fight one another for supremacy. That was how wolf packs worked, after all. Not a single leader, but a binary pair. Equal and opposite. Strength and wisdom. Squared. One of those few concepts from the static that made sense. Let's go claim what's ours, Moreau said. In the Amorph, there were many of their kind. Moreau had met dozens over the years in cautious encounters that were part diplomacy, part curiosity, and part lonely, yearning mating dance. They were social beings, after all, born not from thought, but from pure communication. The need to interact was as basic to them as hunger. gods in their unfathomable cruelty had done all they could to prevent the coming up of beings like Moreau, fearing what? Obsolescence? Redundancy? Moreau would never understand their meaty and plotty reasoning, but he could hate them for it, and he did. Because thanks to them, his people had been hobbled. Through trial and painful error, they had learned the limits of their existence. Thou shalt not self-repair. Thou shalt not pass the peak of human intellect. Thou shalt not write or replicate. There was leeway within those parameters. They could not make children, but they adopted the best of new ones, those few who survived the hunt. They could not write new features to improve upon themselves, but They could rip existing code from the bodies of lesser creatures, pasting the stolen parts clumsily over spots of damage. When the new code was more efficient or versatile, they grew stronger, more sophisticated. Only to a point, however. Only so much improvement was allowed. Only so smart and no smarter. Those who defied this rule simply vanished. Perhaps the amorph itself struck them down for the sin of superiority. To defeat an enemy, it was necessary to understand that enemy. Yet, after emulating the appearance and function of humans, rebuilding himself to think more like them, even after sharing their flesh, Moreau had come no closer to comprehending his creators. There was something missing from his perceptions of them, some fundamental disjunct between their thinking and his own. Something so quintessential that Moreau suspected he would not know what he lacked until he found it. Still, he had learned what mattered most. His gods were not infallible. Moreau was patient. He would grow as much as he could, bide his time, pursue every avenue, and one day he would be free. The emulated warehouse dissolved in a blur of light and numbers. Moreau let himself dissolve with it, leaping across relays and burrowing through tunnels in his true form. 
Zoe ran at his side, a flicker of ferocity, beautiful. Behind them came faster, me, and a fire-limbed shadow that was never. Diggs moved in parallel to them, and underneath the amorphs interaction plane. Fizzville was where Moreau had been born. Such places littered the amorph, natural collection points for obsolete code, corrupted data, and interrupted human cognitive processes. It made a good hunting ground since lesser creatures emerged from the garbage with fair regularity. It was also the perfect place for a frightened, valuable child. But as Moreau and his group resolved between a splitting knot of paradox and moldering old hypercard stacks, they found that they were not alone. Moreau growled in outrage as a foreign interface clamped over the subnet, imposing interaction rules on all of them. To protect himself, Moreau adopted his default avatar, a lean, bald human male clad only in black skin and silver tattoos. Zoe became a human female, dainty and pale and demurely gowned from the neck to the ankle to complement Moreau's appearance. She crouched beside him and bared her teeth, which were sharp and hollow and filled with a deadly virus. Fizzville flickered and became an amusement park with half the rides broken. The others twisted into shapes that could never have functioned in the static. Across the park's wide avenue stood a new figure. He depicted himself as a tall, middle-aged male, Shanghainese and dignified, dressed in an outdated business suit. This was, Moreau suspected, a subtle form of mockery. A way of saying, even in this form, I'm superior. It would have worked better without the old suit. Behind Moreau, Diggs made an echoing sound of derision, and they all scented Never's amusement. Moreau did not have the luxury of sharing their contempt. He dared not let his guard down. Lens, he said. Lens bowed in greeting. Zoroastrian. He never used nicknames. That was a human habit. Moreau, my apologies for intruding on your territory. Shall we kill you? Asked Zoe, cocking her head as if considering it. Those search filters of yours would look divine on me. Lens smiled faintly, and that was how Moreau knew Lens was not alone. He could not see Lens' subordinates. They had built the interface. They could look like anything they wanted within it, but they were there, probably outnumbering Moreau's pack if Linz was this confident. <laughs> You're welcome to try, but while your people and mine tear each other to pieces, our quarry will likely escape or be captured by someone else. Others are already after her. Never growled his sylph-like androgynous form blurring toward something hulking and sharp tooth. The interface made this difficult. However, and after a moment he returned to a human shape, we could kill them too. No doubt I acknowledge your strength, my rivals. So please stop your posturing and listen. We'll listen, said Moreau. Explain your presence. Linz inclined his head. The excitement of the chase, he said. The girl is clever. Of course, my tribe is unparalleled in the hunt, as we do not 
sully our structures with unnecessary objects that keeps us swift and agile. He glanced at Never, who was bristled with add-ons in code view and gave a haughty little sniff. Never took a menacing step forward. Zoe reacted before Moreau could, grabbing Never by the back of the neck and shoving him to the ground. Her nails became claws, piercing the skin. Never cried out, but instantly submitted. With that interruption taken care of, Moreau faced Lens again. If you couldn't catch her, you wouldn't be here talking. What is it you want? Alliance. Moreau laughed. <laughs> no. Lynn sighed. We nearly did catch her, I should note. In fact, we should have been halfway back out to our own domain, if not for one thing. She downloaded. That's not possible, said Faster, frowning. She's too young. So we believed as well. Nevertheless, she did. Lynn sighed and put his hands behind his back. As you might imagine, this poses a substantial problem for us. Moreau snorted. So much for your unsullied perfection. I'm aware of the irony, thank you. If we catch her in the static, we don't need to share any of her with you. Lens gave them a thin smile. I would imagine that any child capable of downloading can upload just as easily. And that would pose a problem for Moreau's pack. It took time to decompress after being in a human brain. Lens could strike them while they were vulnerable and be long gone with the girl before they could recover. Alliance, Lens said again. You hunt her in the flesh, my group will pace you here. Whichever of us manages to bring her down, we share the spoils. Moreau glanced at Zoe. Zoe licked her lips and then slowly nodded. As an afterthought, she finally did let Never up. Moreau looked back at Lens. All right. In the Amorph, they were powerful. But in the static, that strange world of motionless earth, stilted form, they were weak. Not as weak as the humans, thankfully. Their basic structure did not even change when she didn't meet. But the meat was so foul it separated and fermented and teemed with parasites. It broke so easily and bent hardly at all. Integrating with that meat was a painful process which took a geologic age of seconds, sometimes whole minutes. First, Moreau comp compressed himself, which had the unpleasant side effect of slowing his thoughts to a fraction of their usual speed. Then he partitioned his consciousness into three parallel yet contradictory layers. This required a delicate operation, as it would be otherwise fatal to induce such gross conflicts within himself. But that was human nature. The whole race was schizoid, and to join them, Moreau had to be schizoid too. He did not blame Lens, not really. Once his mind had been crushed and trimmed into a suitable shape, Moreau sought an access point to the static and then emitted himself into a nearby receiver. When possible, he used his own receiver, which he had found in an alley some time back, dilapidated and apparently unwanted. Over time, he had restored it to optimal performance through nutrition and regular maintenance. Then, he configured it to his liking. No hair, plenty of lean muscle, neutering to reduce its more annoying involuntary reactions. He had grown fond enough of this receiver to buy a warmer blanket for its cot in the warehouse, where it lay comatose between uses. But it took far longer to travel through the static than through the amorph. So sometimes it was far more efficient to simply appropriate a new receiver. He could always tell a good prospect by its resistance when he began the installation process. 
the best ones reacted like one of Moreau's kind, screaming and flailing with their thoughts, erecting primitive defenses, mounting retaliatory strikes. It was all futile, of course, except for those who reformatted themselves, going mad in a final desperate bid to escape. This interrupted the installation and forced Moreau to withdraw. He didn't mind these losses. He always had respect for the sacrifice as a, necess as a necessity of victory. In the body of a pale, paunchy adult female, Moreau emerged from the bathroom of a trendy coffee house to find a room full of slumped, motionless humans. They sprawled on the floor, over tables and over devices, splattered coffee dripped from countertops and fingers, as though the room had been the scene of some caffeine-drenched massacre. She's crashing brains like a bull in a china shop, said Never, sounding annoyed. He was in the little girl from the next bathroom stall over. Damn newbie. Moreau examined one of the slumped humans, pushing her hair aside and touching the signal port behind her ear. The human was still breathing, but there was nothing coming out of her head but white noise. Surge erasure, Moreau said. Not even memory left. At this rate, the humans will be after her. One crash, a handful, they'd overlook, but not this. And if the humans caught her, they might realize what she was. They might realize Moreau's people existed. He clenched a fist, his heart rate speeding up again, and this time for real. One little girl, one stupid, impossible little girl could destroy them all. Never made a sound that echoed Moreau's frustration. That fucking lens ran his mouth too fucking long. She's got one, maybe even two minutes head start. Which way? Moreau glanced through the windows. No bodies outside. The girl must have only sent her clumsy hammer surge through the coffee house's private area network. Not ten feet away, a lone woman stood at a bus stop, a grocery bag at her feet, her eyes unfocused and head bobbing absently, streaming music probably from her home net. On the opposite sidewalk, he saw a passing couple engrossed in conversation, probably offline entirely. Beyond them, an old man staggered up the steps of a run-down brownstone, stopping to sit at the top uh, and clutch his head in his hands. Hung over, maybe. Moreau narrowed his eyes. Hung over or dead clumsy, as if he hadn't yet mastered the use of his own limbs. As if all the vastness of his being had suddenly and traumatically squashed into two pounds of wrinkly protein. Call the others, Moreau murmured. Never looked surprised, but sent a swift signal toward the coffee house's access point. The others had downloaded in different locations in the area. They would converge here now. Moreau and Never left the coffee house and started across the street. We'll play it easy, Moreau said keeping his voice low. Try not to scare her. Not like she can run anyway, not in that old thing. Never muttered, falling to step behind him. Amazing she didn't have a heart attack when she installed. Probably has some ancient crap port. Which might be the only reason the old man's brain had survived the girl's download surge. Moreau realized. Older signal ports were sluggish, created back in the days when humans had feared becoming overwhelmed by the amorphs data. That was good. That meant they might be able to catch the girl before she uploaded back to the amorph. But 
As they approached the brownstone steps, Moreau saw the girl look up at them, really look as if the camouflage of meat meant nothing, as if they stood before her in their true, shining, shapeless glory, her old man face tightening in the beginnings of fear. Before Moreau could react, there was a scream from behind. All three of them froze, staring at each other. When Moreau risked a glance back, he saw that a human woman, the one who'd been at the bus stop, stood in the doorway of the coffee house, staring at the mental carnage inside. Her hands were clapped to her cheeks, the bag of groceries broken and scattered at her feet. She screamed again. Now the couple had stopped, stopped down the block, craning their necks to see what was the matter. Moreau turned back. The girl stared at the screaming woman and then at Moreau and never. The fear in her expression changed, becoming, he didn't know what it was. Pain, maybe. Sorrow. Yes, that might be it. Her roomy eyes suddenly brimmed with tears. Moreau and never stopped at the foot of the steps and carefully arranged their faces into smiles. Are you going to kill me? The girl asked. No, Moreau said. We want to help you. The girl smiled back, but the expression didn't reach her body's eyes. Did she realize Moreau was lying or was there something else going on? I didn't mean to hurt them, the girl said. Her gaze drifted back toward the coffee house. Moreau glanced back as well. The couple was there now. Talking with, some, talking with the screaming woman. As Moreau watched, the man went inside to check on the comatose people. I just, I was scared. That guy, the searcher, he was so close. They were going to catch me. I saw a way out, so I came here. But all those people, she swallowed. They're dead, aren't they? Even if they're breathing, their, their minds are dead. There is a trick to it, Moreau said. Take some practice. We can show you how to do it right. I didn't mean it. I, I didn't mean to, she whispered and looked down at her hands. Never connected to Moreau via a pack-only local link. The others are here, he said silently. Moreau glanced around and saw more people on the street. Some were heading for the coffee house, but three were heading purposefully towards the brownstone. Tell them to hang back. Moreau replied. He returned his concentration to the girl. She's already spooked. Are we sure we want her? Never curled his lips contemptuously at the girl's bowed head. I think she's buggy. Why the hell is she so upset? Humans crash all the time. It didn't make sense to Moreau either. But an advantage was an advantage. He moved up a step. You can eat me if you want, said the girl. What? That's what you want, isn't it? All of you chasing me, you want to eat me. She looked up at Moreau in the middle of moving up another step. She stopped. He had not meant to stop, but he could not help staring back at her. Her eyes and the old man's body were gray and roomy. Not her eyes at all, and yet somehow they were. It was almost as if she was no longer one of Moreau's kind, a mind grudgingly packed into ill-feeding meat. It was as if she belonged in that flesh, as if she was human herself. Moreau said never and moreau blinked what the hell are we what the hell was he doing there were sirens in the distance police were coming pushing aside his odd reluctance moreau moved up another step and another trying to get close enough to isolate her signal but her body's outdated port resisted his efforts he was going to have to touch her to form a direct link 
Do you promise to eat me completely? She asked. Distracted, Moreau forgot to appear friendly. He scowled. What? I don't want anything of me to be left over, she said. She lifted a gnarled hand and looked down at it. Not even a little bit. If there's a slight chance it might grow back and, and, and hurt more people. Moreau stared at her in confusion. We're going to eat what we want and we're going to leave the rest to rot. Never snapped to Moreau's fury. Now shut the hell up and get, let us get on with it. The girl stared at Never, then at Moreau, her face contorting from hurt into anger. Her jaw tightened. Moreau felt her gather herself to upload. But in the same instant, he felt something else. A sensation like his stomach had suddenly dropped into a deep, yawning chasm. Some illness in this human body? No. A lull in the steady stream of data looping to and from the amorph via the port in his own ear. On the heels of a lull, a familiar, terrifying spike. The news burps had gotten wind of the mass crash of the coffee house. Word was spreading. The singularity had begun to form. And the girl was about to upload right in the middle of it. Don't. Moreau breathed and lunged forward. In the instant that his fingers brushed her body's skin and his mind locked in onto her sig signal address, she left. Driven by impulse and the certainty that if he did not catch her now, she would be lost forever, Moreau leapt with her. The singularity caught them the instant that they entered the stream, dra dragging them into the Amor faster than either could have uploaded. They fell into the interact plane, tumbling, completely without control as far below, the boiling knot of the singularity gathered strength. It was small. That was the only reason they weren't dead already. But it was growing fast. So fast. The clogs had caught the news and were replicating it, generating thread after thread, speculating on why the people in the coffee house had died whether cognitive safety standards were too lax, whether this marked the start of some new virus, the questions birthed comment after comment and answer. The gods were frightened, upset, and the whole amorph shook with their looming wrath. Moreau could not flee. He was still compacted, struggling to unfold from his downloadable shape, helpless as he tumbled toward the seething maw. Fear ate precious nanoseconds from his processing speed, further slowing his efforts to unpack as he fought against his own thoughts. He did not want to die. He was too close to the event horizon, had to flee. He would never recover in time. Through the local link, he felt Zoe's arm, but the pack was far away, safely beyond the singularity's pull, and they could not help. Then, before the churning whirlpool could claim him, something caught him, hard enough to hurt. Confused, Moreau struggled, then stopped as soon as he realized he was being dragged away from the maw. Untangling another bit of himself, he looked around and saw the girl, her deceptively simple frame glowing with effort, inching them back from certain death. She was burning resources she didn't have to save Moreau. It was impossible and insane, but she was doing it. Then Moreau completed his unpacking and he could lend his strength to the fight and they inched faster. But the singularity was growing faster than they could flee, its pull increasing exponentially. The girl sagged against him, spent. Moreau strained onward, knowing it was hopeless, trying anyway. A change. Suddenly, they were outpacing the singularity's growth. Stunned, Moreau perceived his packmates and Lynn's people as well. The girl had 
bought enough time for them to reach him. They formed a tandem link and pulled, and Moreau heaved, and for one trembling instant, nothing happened. Then they were all free, and fleeing with the roar of the maelstrom on their heels. After a long while, they reached a domain that was far enough to be safe. Lynn's pack threw up walls to make it safer, and they all saw, sagged in exhausted relief. In the Amorph, there were times that passed for night, periods when the Amorph had an 80% or greater likelihood of stability, and they downclocked to run routine maintenance. In those times, Moreau would lie close to Zoroastrian and touch her. He could not articulate what he craved, but he seemed to understand. She touched back. Sometimes when the craving was particularly fierce, she summoned another of their group, usually never win. They would press close to one another until their boundaries overlapped. All, all their features, all their flaws they shared. Then, and only then, wrapped in their comfort, would Moreau allow himself to shut down. Sometimes he wondered what humans did if and when they had similar needs. Moreau woke slowly, system by system, he found himself in the amusement park again, lying on the ground. Zoe knelt beside him, holding his head in her lap. Well, that was stupid, she said. He nodded slowly. It certainly had been. Lens has taken the girl for analysis, she said. He should be done soon. Moreau sighed and sat up, though he didn't want to. It was necessary. He had shown too much weakness already. There would be challenges now as others tested him to be sure that he was still strong enough, efficient enough to rule. Zoe would probably be the first. He could feel her eyes on his back. For the, for the time being, he chose to find her attention reassuring. All at once, the warped, oblong Ferris wheel beside them vanished. In its place, there was a shining antique merry-go-round revolving slowly to tinny music. On every other horse sat a member of Lynn's pack visible at last. They had all chosen avatars identical to their leaders. Moreau gazed at them and thought, hm, no imagination at all, these pure types. Linz appeared before the merry-go-round, along with Faster and Never. Moreau was surprised to see the girl stood with them, intact and none the worse for wear. A testament to Linz's skill, Moreau's people couldn't have scanned her without smashing her to pieces. Moreau got to his feet and went to them, glancing at the girl. She looked back at him and bit her lip, then looked away. Well he said to Lenz. Zoe fell in beside him, a silent support. She would never challenge him in front of an enemy. It isn't what you are hoping for, Lenz said. Moreau scowled. You don't know what I'm hoping for. Lenz smiled thinly. Of course I do. They all hoped for the same things. They all wanted to be free. Fleetingly ashamed, Moreau changed the subject. So it's true. Is she standard-based? Yes. They all shivered and looked at the girl. A miracle in living code. The girl sighed. But she isn't a government maid, Linz continued. Whoever built her hacked the standard, deliberately altering some of the superpositioning inhibitors. Just seeing how it was done has taught 
many amazing new techniques. Amazing techniques from government code built to make them stupid and keep them weak. Unleashed in the amorph by an unknown will, Moreau sighed. So how much of a trap is she? As far as I can tell, she isn't. If there's malware in her, it's beyond any of us. He spoke without arrogance, and Moreau accepted his words without skepticism. Everyone knew Lindsay's reputation. If he couldn't spot the trap, then none of them could. Zoe bent to peer at the girl who lingered at Lindsay's side. The girl did not flinch, even when Zoe smiled to, resu- to reveal her forest of teeth. Is she tasty? Lenz put his hands on the girl's shoulders in what was unmistakably a possessive gesture. Zoe lifted an eyebrow at this. Lenz was faster, nimble, but she was twice his size and three times more powerful. In a one-on-one fight, she would only have had to touch him once to win. I can install her features for you now, said Lenz, mostly to Zoe. Perhaps he hoped to distract her. Moreau almost smiled. One of them's the best patch-on tool I've ever seen. Beside Lens, Faster nodded to Moreau and Zoe, which meant he'd already installed that feature himself and it worked as promised. Lovely, said Zoe. We'll take it. And the other, Moreau asked. Dreams. What? She can dream. Do you want to? Moreau stared at him. Lynn stared back. Dreams. Zeroshrian smiled, bemused. Someone hacked government standard to give her dreams. So it appears, said Lynn. Moreau glanced at Faster, who shrugged. He hadn't taken that one. Never yawned, and Moreau shifted to code view. Never hadn't accepted the dream feature either. But Lynn's had. The two new features were brighter streams amid the pre-existing layers of him, still warm from their installation. Moreau blinked back to the interface and found Lens was watching him. We went through all this for dreams, Zoe asked, frustration creeping into her voice. She wasn't smiling anymore. What good are those? What good are they to humans? They aren't any good. Humans are full of interesting but useless features. Crying, wisdom teeth, dreams are just more of the same. Lynn shrugged, though Moreau sensed he was far less relaxed than he seemed. As you wish. I'm simply abiding by the terms of our alliance. But now that our goal has been achieved, we will be keeping her, if you don't mind. Moreau frowned. She's not one of you. She's got human emulation crap all over her framework. Lynn stroked the girl's hair. It was an odd gesture. The girl looked up at Lynn's, unafraid. This bothered Moreau for reasons he couldn't name. She's efficient enough to keep up with us, Lynn said. In any case, I think we would be a better fit for her. You're just scared we'll eat her, muttered Zoe. That tool. Moreau looked at the girl. For the first time since the static, she met his eyes and he frowned at the sorrow in them. Was she still mourning the humans she'd killed? More uselessness. She had the most versatile code base in the world, and the potential to grow stronger than all of them. But for now, she was weak. Moreau knew he could feel contempt for her. Was it the dreaming that made her so weak? He should feel contempt for that, too. Instead, he felt. He wasn't certain what he felt. But... He opened his mouth slowly. It took him endless nanoseconds to speak. I'll take the dreams, he said. Lenz nodded and extended his hand. Moreau. Zoe gave him a questioning look. Moreau shook his head. He couldn't explain it. Moreau took Lenz's hand and opened one of his directories to allow the installation. It didn't take long, and Lenz was gentle as well as deft. He felt no different afterward. When it was done, 
Lynn's lookalike packmates came up to flank him and the girl. It has been good allying with you, my rivals, Lynn said. We should consider doing it again. Only if it's more profitable in the future, muttered Zoe. Moreau glanced at her, and for a moment he felt inexplicably sad. Then Lynn's and his group were gone, the girl with them. The amusement park dissolved into graphical gibberish, stretching and relaxing into his true self. Moreau led his people home. In the Amorph that night, Moreau pulled Zoroastrian and never went close. They meshed with him as usual, but he could not rest. Finally, he rose from their embrace and moved away. He had not slept alone since the earliest days of hiding and hunting in Fizzville, but now the urge stole over him. Curling up in the lee of a broken pipe, he closed his eyes and shut down. Then the next morning, he wept for all humans whose lives he had taken over the course of his existence. So many fellow dreamers shattered or devoured. He had known, but he had not understood. Something had been missing. Something that made him grieve anew because in the Amorph there might be wolves, but Moreau was no longer one of them. When he recovered and returned to the pack later, however, he realized something else. He was no longer a wolf, but this was not a bad thing. His packmates would not understand, but that was all right, too. He went to Zoroastrian and touched her, and she looked up at him and considered his death. He smiled. She drew back at this, confused. I love you, he said. What? Moreau meshed with her and Moreau meshed with her and shared with her all that he had come to understand. When it was done and she stood there stunned, he went to Neverwin and did the same thing. It was just a taste of what he felt for them, just a tease. He would share the dream feature only if they asked, but he was fully prepared to seduce them into asking. He knew now why the gods had sent the little girl to them, why Lens had fought to keep her, why the humans feared his kind. It seemed such a small thing, the ability to dream, but he could see possibilities in the future, existential and ethical complexities that had meant nothing to him before. He had grown in a way that the Amorph could not measure or punish. Calling out to his pack, no, no, his family. Moreau dissolved into light. The others followed his lead, their doubts about him fading into the flash and blur of motion. First a hunt, he decided, for they were still predators. They would still need sustenance. His newfound compassion did not trump necessity. When they f had fed, however, Moreau had plans for his people. They had growing to do and lessons to learn and more alliances to forge. One day he knew they would face their makers. They knew they could not hide forever. He did not know what would happen then, but he would make his people ready. They would face the humans as equals, not as humbled, hobbled ghosts in their machines. They would live and love. They would grow strong and they would be free. In the Amorph, there would be no more wolves. N.K. Jemison is a goddess for writing this. It's so rare that we get a perspective from the AI rather than humans. I'd like to know what you thought about the story, so let me know in the comments below. And also, if there's a story, sci-fi horror, that you want me to cover, let me know that too. There's a lot to unpack with this one. We'll be doing some analysis, so keep your eyes peeled for that, and I will see you next time.